Uh, good morning, everybody. I must say, uh, you're all looking pretty good after last night. Uh, let's see how you... Will you all put your right hand in the air, please? Put your right hand in the air, fine. Drop it down on the left knee of the person you're sitting next to. <laughs> Just give it a little squeeze. Say, so, I hope you enjoy yourself. This guy here thinks it's Christmas. <laughs> a couple of guys over here having a broke back mountain moment. <laughs> here we are. Right. Um, well, well, I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the NHS for a little while. Um, uh, but I thought I'd start with this. Has anybody seen this painting? Anybody in the... Because you're all retired, living on huge pensions, aren't you? Travelling the world. Yeah. Have you seen this painting? What do you think of it? I thought it was wonderful. Tim? What did you think of it? I thought it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah, she's come all the way to say she thought it was wonderful. Thank you. Give her a round of applause. That's very good. It is, you're absolutely right, it's one of the top five paintings in the world. It's uh, by Velasque, Diego Velasque, painted it in 1656, and it's called Las Meninas. Now, Las Meninas means the little princesses. And if you look at the picture, it's not actually what it looks like. It's got nothing to do with Las Meninas, it's got nothing to do with little princesses. What it's got to do with is the figure on your left, the laughing cavalier type figure that you can see with a paintbrush in his hand. That is actually Velasque. And Velasque is painting a self-portrait, but he set himself in the setting of the Spanish royal court. And there are lots of symbols in this picture. You can see the big mastiff dog in the front there, symbol of great wealth and power. You can see the wet nurse in the background. In the, uh, in the doorway, there's the Chamberlain. Wonderful story about the Chamberlain. I don't have time to go into it, but it's an interesting story. And you can see in the middle uh, of the picture, there's what looks like another picture hanging on the wall. Actually, it's not a picture, it's a mirror. And if you can imagine how expensive mirrors were in those days. Reflected in the mirror are the king and queen of Spain. So what Velasque has done is he put you, the viewer, in the role of the sitter. He's actually not painting Las Meninas, the little princesses. He's painting the king and queen of Spain. Now, the interesting thing about it is he's saying, hey, I'm a really big, important painter. I paint huge paintings because it is big, isn't it? It's 10 foot tall, this picture, 9 foot wide, huge picture. He's saying, I'm a very important person. I only paint very important people. I am the Simon Cowell of the 1600s. <laughs> very important guy. And, uh, OK, well, let's, let's have a look at another picture, shall we? Picasso, Las Meninas. Now, he did this a lot. What do we notice in this picture? It's a monochrome, no rich colours. The little, uh, the big mastiff dog has been turned into a sausage dog. Can you see? And if you look at the figure of the painter, Velasque, his face is cut in half, and he's looking at himself. He's admiring himself. And if you look at the mirror, you can see, actually, it's not the king and queen of Spain, it's a clown. Why has Picasso done that? Well, you will know how Picasso felt about the Spanish Civil War. You've probably all seen Guernica, his fantastic painting. This is Picasso saying to the art establishment. He's saying, anybody can do chocolate box pictures. I can paint pictures with meaning and symbolism. It's a very different picture but it's still Las Meninas. Now, why am I talking to you about the history of art this morning? Well, it's I'm in the wrong conference. I thought I should be... <laughs> oh, shit. This is the Ann Summers alumni, isn't it? This is symbolism for the NHS. The NHS, born on the 5th of July 1948, probably the most noble thing that uh, post-war politicians could have done. My, I was born before the NHS, and this is where I, in my script it says, pause while the audience gasp and say, surely not. <laughs> so we'll just do that bit again. I was born before the NHS. Oh. No, you... There's only one guy got it right. He's still getting over his, over his, having his knees touched. Right. Um, I was born before the NHS, my dad was a window cleaner, my mum was a shop worker, my dad had to save up the equivalent of three weeks wages in order for a midwife to come in and deliver me. Uh, my mum was in uh, labour for 12 hours, she said it was worth every minute. <laughs> I don't remember a thing, it didn't hurt, I don't know what all the fuss is about. And um, 
but now we've got a different NHS. We've got NHS with all kinds of pressures. We've got, it's still there. It still kind of looks like the NHS, but it's not really the NHS. It's not the NHS that we once knew and recognized. And it's changing even a bit more, I think. We've had uh, the uh, Health and Social Care Act, uh, here it is. It's uh, one of the biggest pieces of legislation ever to affect um, the NHS, and I'm, it's 432 pages, and I'm just going to start reading it now. No, I won't bother with that. And uh, this is what we think about it. That's, um... <laughs> You've got to excuse me. I've got a little dew drop on my nose. I'm suffering with the only thing that the NHS can't clear up, and that's man flu. I am heroic to even be here. Don't start. Right. Now look, I know it's a Sunday morning and I know this is the last thing you want to see, but I am going to do a graph. Okay? Any accountants in the audience? Accountants? Put your hand if you're an accountant. Put your hand if you know an accountant. Yes, yes. Put your hand if you wish you didn't know an accountant. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to draw a graph. This might be complicated for you, but hey, I'll explain it to you. So go with me on this. Got that? Right, this is demand in the NHS. It goes up by about 4% a year, but it's variable. In London, it's going up by 8%. In a city like Birmingham, it's about 7%, but on average, we have a 4% growth every year. And uh, the money kind of follows, uh, follows the growth in demand in e each year, except here we are now in this period, 2010 and 2015. This is the so-called current spending cycle. And the government have said, with some justification, just that they have ring-fenced the NHS funding. They haven't ring-fenced social services, that's been cut by 27%, and I know a lot of you will be doing great and charitable work in supporting people in their own homes, and thank you for that. But the NHS has been ring-fenced, and it's been ring-fenced to the tune of 0.1% a year against 4% growth. So the politicians, if they say, we put more money into the NHS, they have. It's true, but it's 0.1%. So it has the effect of flatlining the funding. And this, in the middle here, gives us a problem. This is the triangle of terror. No one knows what to do. This is our big problem. This is, you would have seen it in the newspapers, the NHS has to save £20 billion by 2015. This is where it is. This is why there are 20,000 nursing vacancies, 40,000 managers have got the sack. This is why the NHS is under huge pressure like never before. Now, of course, the big question is, well, okay, well, what happens after 2015? Well, unless we find a diamond mine in Milton Keynes, or we do a bit of fracking in Berkshire, oh my goodness, no, not fracking in Berkshire. <laughs> Oh my God, you're having a laugh. <laughs> Do it up north where the poor people live. <laughs> so the big problem is, what happens after 2015? We don't have the, tri the Triangle of Terror, we have the Tetrahedron of Doom. How do we fund the big blue bit? This is where the politicians say the NHS has got to change. If you noticed, whenever they say it's got to, they will say, the NHS has got to change. <laughs> and they stick their ass out, don't they? Have you noticed? <laughs> they can't say change. The reason is they're talking out their ass. The, <laughs> the NHS has got to change. Change from what? I travel the world talking about the NHS. People will say to me, Roy, the NHS is the most fabulous thing. We wish our health service was like your health service. Free at the point of need, gathered by taxes, funded by taxes. We wish our health service was like your health service. And this is where we get to the point. This is where we have co-payments. This is where people say, well, I think my solution is everybody should pay £10 to go and see a GP. Put your hand up if you think that. You're mad. <laughs> How much do you think it would cost to collect £10? The NHS? Cost you 30 quid to collect it. And if they didn't pay for it, it cost you a thousand pounds to take these people through the courts and make them homeless for your tenor. It's balmy, isn't it? But this is where we get into co-payments. Hey, co-payments, you've got your right hand pocket for your taxes, your left hand pocket for your co-payments, right? Still your trousers. You still have to pay. Somehow or other it has to be funded. 
We get to the point, do we, where we go into hospital and we say, we do bed and breakfast, but if you want something to eat in the evening, you have to have your mum bring a stew in. That's what they do in Portugal. Just where we say to people, hey, you're having a baby, great, I'm so pleased. Terrific. But that's a condition, and the NHS only does illness and sickness, so you have to pay for your own midwife. Like my dad did in 1948, before the NHS. Makes you think, doesn't it? What is the future of the NHS? Well, listen, get over it. We've got to pay for it. There is no politician on God's earth at the moment that wants to talk about ta putting taxes up because they all want a low-tax economy. I think it's a great idea. But I think if you ask the great British public and said, you want to put Tuppence hypothecated onto the NHS, give it some headroom, give it a breather, I think most people would say probably yes. So this is our big problem. Our big problem is we've got 800,000 old ladies who can't remember who they are. Dementia. 800,000 people who can't remember who they are. We've got God knows how many fractured families who can't turn ingredients into a meal. And we've got God knows how many people sit on the sofa and eat these things. Obesity is the big next epidemic. I thought you'd like this, I'm going to show you a graph. This is the technical bit, okay? This is the World Health Organization. Now, the pink line is women and the blue line is men. As you can see, women live longer than men. And there's a very good reason for that. It's because men lead blameless lives and are taken unto our Lord early. <laughs> Woman down says, no, it's not. <laughs> Stop laughing. <laughs> what I wanted to do, I just wanted you to share with me this, um, just this, uh, these, these, between these two yellow lines here, this is the, uh, this is the box of death. The box of, is that the tetrahedron of terror? This is the box of death. What's all this about? Well, the World Health Organization tells us that most of us will die of something that was pre-diagnosed 17 years earlier. What's all that about? Well, you're walking down the street, you, say, mate, you see your friend Harry, say, Harry, haven't seen you at the golf club for a while. How are you doing? Oh, well, I'm not playing so much golf. Didn't feel too good. Went and saw the doctor. I've got a kind of blood pressure thing, and I'm on some pills, but I'm okay. And then you don't see him for a while, and you say, Harry, how are you? How's your blood pressure? He said, ah, forget the blood pressure. I didn't feel too good. I went and saw the doctor, and the doctor said, hey, guess what? You're diabetic. Ha! <laughs> Me. Diabetic. I couldn't believe it. And then you don't see him for a while. And you say, Harry, how are you? How's your blood pressure and your diabetes? He said, well, listen, he said, I, I had trouble getting up the stairs. I'm breathless. I've got a little puffer thing. I'm okay. I've got pills for my diabetes. I've got pills for my blood pressure. I've got my puffer thing to help me get upstairs. I'm fine. Then you don't see him for a while. And you see his wife in Sainsbury. And you say, hi, Susan. How's Harry? She said, haven't you heard? What? He's had a stroke. You see, this is what's called a long-term condition. And long-term conditions aren't feckless people who live on the other side of town. It's us in our middle-class lives. It's the way we live our lives today. Have any of you ladies got one of these at home? I saw a few at breakfast, let me tell you. God, you can't half shovel it in. Anyway, um, listen, this is our problem, isn't it? This is, this, is the, this is the big epidemic that's costing all the money in the NHS. It's not just being overweight. If you're healthy, it's fine. But if you're not, hey, it's costing us all a fortune. And what do we do about that? Well, it's the law, really. The law changes people's habits. Seatbelts in cars, crash helmets on motorbikes, smoking in the workplace, smoking in cars, health and safety legislation. We laugh about it, but it saves people's lives. So the next question is, the extent to which government should interfere in the lives of ordinary people to stop things like this happening? How do we handle that? What do we do about that? How do we handle the whole idea of food? I tell you what we could do, we could put scales by the bus stop, and the bus driver comes along, get on the scales, he said, no, you're a fat bastard, you've got to walk. <laughs> Th 
This, I took this picture in, uh, in the States at, uh, in the summer. This is Walmart. You spend $30 in Walmart, they give you free diabetes meds. It'll happen here. Oh dear. Now, ladies, this is one for you. Could you put your hands up? Any ladies here who are size 12 dress size? Size 12. Is it all in size 12s? Put your hands up because we've got some vouchers from Harrods to give away. <laughs> okay, size so Suddenly all the other hands go, I can get into a 12. I'm sure I can. Right. Well, the interesting thing about a size 12 is, um, is the British standard size 12 is the correct size 12 is 34, 26, 36. Uh, but of course, if you go shopping in Wallace, it's 36, 28, 39. <laughs> if you go to Oasis, it's 35, 27, 38. I did not have fun researching this, I tell you. Um, <laughs> If you go, go to next, it's 34, 26, 37. And uh, if you go to Marks and Spencers, it's 35, 28 and a half, and 37 and a half. But they're cut very small this year. We're kidding ourselves, aren't we? I was in Marks the other day buying, some, uh, buying a pair of jeans. A guy was in the next cubicle to me said, here, lass, come here. I think he loved her. Here, lass, come here. Do these jeans make me look fat? She said, no, it's your ass and your beer belly that does that. <laughs> I was in California, Sunset Boulevard. There's a size 10 dress shop. Every dress in the shop is a size 10. You can get a small size 10, a medium size 10. A <laughs> We're kidding ourselves. We're never going to solve this until we wake up. Okay, what have we got here? Let's have a look. What about this? Self-checkouts. Put your hand if you like self-checkouts. Yeah? Put your hand up if you don't like self-checkouts. Put your hand up if you don't give a shit, you send the wife, so that's it. <laughs> What about sat-nav? Who like, who's got a sat-nav? Yeah? Yeah, I've got a sat-nav. Do you give your sat-nav a name? Mine's called Beatrice. Mm, she says, please do a U-turn when it's safe to do so. <laughs> Whip me, beat me, call me trash. <laughs> Paid extra for that. Sometimes... Uh, <laughs> Sometimes if I'm lonely at the weekend, you know, because I'm a lonely bachelor, I get in the car and go out for a drive and go wrong, just so she'll give me bollocking. I just love it. I can't tell. <laughs> in the supermarkets, of course, it's a different thing in the supermarket, isn't it? Inside the supermarket thing, there's a, there's a, there's a big woman with a hairy mole called Brenda. And uh, she says things like, unexpected item in the bagging area. <laughs> I mean, Tesco's, there are 50,000 items. What the hell have I bought that's unexpected? <laughs> you buy a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc, authorization required. <laughs> and then some child comes and authorizes it. <laughs> they call it. Letting the customer add value to the business. That means you do what they used to do. It's like on an airline, isn't it? You schedule yourself, you print your own ticket with your own ink on your own bit of paper, you get yourself to the airport, you carry your own bags, you check yourself in, you get on the plane, you're giving them 800 quid, all they've got to do is get you there on time, and they're late. <laughs> That's how it works. And hey, you know, NHS has got to change. I think we've got to take more responsibility for ourselves and we've got to do more things for ourselves. Now, this is my mum. My mum's 94, and here she is with her best friend. Her iPad, not me. <laughs> my mum loves her iPad. She just loves it. She goes shopping on the iPad. She watches the playbacks on the iPad. She downloads porn on the iPad. She just, she just loves it. She's got a bit of a chesty thing going on, so she has to see the respiratory nurse every once in a while. And uh, we go over and see Julie, the chesty nurse, the chesty wheezy nurse. And uh, I was at an exhibition, a health exhibition in Germany called Medica, which is a fantastic exhibition of medical devices. And I bought her uh, a little device that plugs in the iPad, and it's like a kazoo, and you blow into it, and it does what's called a peak flow test. Some of you may know uh, what, what I'm talking about. It does it, you do it three times, it takes an average, it puts it on a graph, and then it says, do you want to email this to your physician? 
because it's American. Physician. And my mum said, well, how, what do I do now then? How do I email this? What do, what do I? I said, well, you can't do that, mum, because we don't do it here. She said, well, that's a bloody silly thing to bring me back from Germany. assistant give him a round of applause thank you I never travel without him see you later whip me beat me call me anyway where was I um, yes so we had to go and see the chesty wheezy nurse and my mum went over there she said hi Julie how you doing she said fine she said hey mum uh, mum in her handbag you know brings out the iPad and we I think oh this is not going to go so well no I don't believe it this is awful my mum said, look, Julie, she said, if I plug this in here, I can blind that, and I can do it every day, and I can email you the results. And I wouldn't have to come over here, and I wouldn't have to have another appointment, I wouldn't have to take up your time. It would be quicker and more efficient. Julie said, we don't do email. For Christ's sake, we don't do email. If the NHS is going to change, you're going to drive change. You're going to say, outpatient appointment, why am I going to go during the day? Why can't I go in the evenings and weekends? Why can't I talk to my doctor on Skype or Facebook? Because that's how you talk to your grandchildren. Why do I have to have this clunky appointment system? Why can't I send Julie my results? You can drive change through the NHS because the NHS belongs to you. So here's my mum. How can the customer add value to the NHS? You'll like this. This is the uh, uh, Kolacheka Bridge in the Honduras. In the Honduras, every year, there's a huge hurricane, tornado season, blows through Honduras and it demolishes everything and they spend the rest of the year sweeping up and rebuilding it. And then it comes and they knock it down again. So the Honduras government said, right, we've got to stop this. They went to Japan and said, can you build us a bridge that would withstand a hurricane? They said, of course we can, and they built it. <laughs> 19... 1994. Hurricane came in 1995, blew the alluvial floodplain to the east and moved the bloody river. <laughs> the NHS was built to last in 1948. The NHS was built to last. It built it and served us well. We built that bridge in 1948, but hey, things are changing. Things have changed. Things have moved on. People's tastes, people's requirements have changed. We all have modern ideas. I doubt there's any of you in the room that doesn't have a computer or access to a computer or a mobile phone. You will drive change. You should be chasing your MP saying, hey, listen, don't talk to me about cutting the NHS. I'll give you tuppence more for it. And hey, make it more modern. Let me use my stuff. And I'm going to just want to leave you with what I call the three Bs. I want you to be ready for what's going to happen. Because after 2015, it's going to get very, very tight financially. None of the political parties are committing themselves to putting more money in the NHS. They're all just about doing flatline funding. So be ready for that. I want you to be open. I want you to be open to new ideas, new treatments, and new ways of getting treatments. And if it means reconfiguring your hospital where you live, hey, it may not be such a bad idea. Don't jump to a conclusion. Look at it carefully. The Rotary Club speaks with a very powerful voice. Make sure your voice is heard. And finally, I want you to be kind. I want you to be kind to the people who work in the NHS because they, they, listen, they have families, they use the NHS too, and they hate what's going on. So if you get frustrated with the bureaucracy and how it's all happening, be kind to them because they don't like it any more than you do. And I told you about my mother earlier. My mum said, where are you going today, Roy? I said, oh, I'm going to the Rotary Club. She said, oh, great. She said, and my mum used to be a voluntary worker. She used to run the tea bar at the local day centre. It was actually run by the uh, Rotary Club. Um, my mum had to give up uh, when she was 85 because she was worried about the CRB check. <laughs> I said, Mum, the fact you're a hooker doesn't matter. I mean, it's just... Uh... She, said, I, she said, they're worried about what I'll do with the vulnerable elderly. I said, for Christ's sake, Mum, you are the vulnerable elderly. 
So she said, when you go, she said, be sure to give them a thank you from me for all the help that the Rotary have given me. So would you all stand up, please? Would you stand up? Would you please stand up? Okay, fine, stand up, that's great. Would you face that direction? Okay. <laughs> and would you give the person in front of you a pat on the back from Roy's mum? <laughs> Just stay, and would you stay standing, stay standing because on the way home, I'll call her. She'll say, how'd you get on? I say, well, I think we had a laugh. We had some fun. And she'll say, good. And she'll say, did you give him a pat on the back? And I'll say, yes. And then she'll ask me a question. This is your opportunity to make an old lady very happy. She'll say, of course, she'll say to me, did they give you a standing ovation? LAUGHTER